All right, let's get started. Always works. So, uh, just a little bit of um, to start today with a little bit of food for thought. So, there's an article I posted on the discussion section of Canvas. It's just an optional thing, but it just it was published this week uh, in a journal that um, uh, it's called GPE, focused on um, genetics and uh, biology and evolution, and it's an article about some DNA that they found um, from mammoths that were preserved on an island. So there's a small population of these things that were isolated on an island for a long amount of time. And what they end up finding, so this is some of the topic of, uh, this is, I guess, some of the topic of food for thought. And, um, and this is the uh, mammoth article that is uh, under the discussion on Canvas. And so what they end up finding is that this particular um, animal found had a bunch of these like deleterious alleles. So we all know that alleles are these particular, uh, you can think of them as, as variants of genes. These particular ones is if they were in the normal population, they would put the animal at, uh, give at, at some cost and would probably be selected out. But what they found is there are such there are so many of these that it suggested that the population size was so small and the isolation so much that these deleterious alleles had ended up spreading through the population and hit fixation. So now, like even though you've been studying genetic algorithms, you now have kind of enough of a background that you've implemented one of these things yourself that to sort of follow this argument is that the population size they have a mutation rate that has been adapted for a larger population, that a larger population would have more diversity and have more selection pressure. And when you then suddenly take that genetic algorithm with those hyperparameters and you change one hyperparameter, the population size, then, and you don't start with a, a, a lot of diversity, then what you can end up getting is no selection pressure, even though you think you might have selection pressure, because maybe with a large population size you did, and because of the no selection pressure, you get something that's bad that spreads through the whole population. And, uh, and then you don't have a high mutation rate, so there's no way for you to sort of get rid of it. And so, and that's exactly what this is sort of a nice example of here. So I like that article, if you just even read through the abstract, because it is a nice example of, you know, where it's the relationship between population size, uh, drift, mutation rate and um, uh, fixation. All things that I feel like as uh, that you now have a little bit more experience with now that you've seen, I know I had people email me and they said, I'm not sure if my genetic algorithm is working when I you know, used it up for a small population size, it didn't quite, it didn't seem, it wasn't very capable of finding the maximum point. And, uh, and so that's an example of how population size can end up having a, a real, uh, can end up amplifying the effect of drift. So you very quickly wash out all of your diversity. When you wash out all your diversity, then the only thing left over is, um, is just drift driving the evolution of these alleles, frequencies, and so you can get things that you would think are bad spreading through the whole population. And that's exactly what they found with these mammoths. They got isolated on an island. There was no way for gene flow to come into the island, so they were stuck with what they had on the island, had a low mutation rate, and, uh, and then just allowed these deleterious mutations to come to fixation. So, it's like a genetic algorithm taking place on an island. So I thought it's kind of a really you know, nice example there. And it just shows how important diversity is going to be. And when we get back to the main topic here, which is these multi-objective genetic algorithms, which will introduce algorithms that have this multi-objective feature to them, we'll see that diversity is even more important. So any sort of mechanism to maintain diversity is going to be, I think, even more important now that we're moving into multi-objective spaces. And so we'll see that. So that's one little bit of food for thought I wanted to put out there. The other thing um, I wanted to mention uh, was, so I teach another, uh, it's a seminar, it's only a one credit hour seminar uh, this semester on the adaptive value of noise in natural distributed systems. And, uh, and so 
<laughs> but it just happened to be that today uh, we were talking about um, what I'm going to call phenotypic variation at the level of the way a cell expresses itself uh, and, and the subject of evolvability. And that actually ends up um, fitting well into these genetic algorithms too, and maybe even a little of what we'll talk about later today when we finally get back to that uh, multi-objective genetic algorithms. And the basic idea here is that when most people think of genotypes and phenotypes, especially in the terms of GAs, you think of the mapping of there's one genotype gets mapped to one phenotype. And so the idea here is I've got some encoding here, which my mutation operator is operating on. And for every encoding here, I get some outcome. And so if your genotype is X, for example, your phenotype might be f of x, and where f of x is some optimization objective. And so I can mutate x, I can change my genotype, and it will end up changing my phenotype. But if I leave my x the same, I get the same phenotype out. Now, under this uh, conceptual framework, then if you need to make a couple of changes, like let's say x is a vector, and uh, it has multiple genes within it, you know, x1, x2, and maybe each one of these is a, you could view as a little vector as well. If you needed to make a change here and a change here in order to arrive at a really interesting solution that would be much better than the state-of-the-art solution, then if you just imagine your genetic algorithm, it's gonna have to, it's gonna be very rare that it's gonna make exactly the right change here and exactly the right change here simultaneously. And if you only make one change, if that leads to a worse solution, then there may be no path for you to explore enough to find both of these. You may have to crank your mutation parameter way up and just and you're basically just rolling dice more often, hoping that you're gonna get that very, very rare event that both of these two things will get mutated in just the right way to discover this really cool phenotype or this really cool genotype that gives you an even better phenotype later. But the thought is, in, uh, in these biological systems, especially um, when we look down at the cell level, then we see um, not one genotype to one phenotype. We see one genotype gets mapped to a distribution of phenotypes. So um, I could say, uh, I'll say distribution of this phenotype. So instead of being f of x, you could view it as a, um, if f of x is sort of the number of outcomes here, then some probabilistic distribution here that maybe has a mean, which is maybe this mean here is f of whatever my x bar is over here, but it has some variance. So in other words, if I have one member of my, if I have a population of a thousand genotypes that are all identical, then the thought would be that even though they're all identical, when I actually evaluate my optimization objective, then I end up getting a distribution of outcomes. It's almost as if this mapping, whereas this top mapping is just f of x, it's almost as if this bottom mapping is f of x plus some noise. So that's an n math cow in noise there. And so um, the, you say, well, why would I ever want to do that? Well, what, what's interesting about this is that if you have multiple members of your population, all with the same genotype, then you can get a distribution of expression from the same genotype that overlaps with other distributions and provides you a way to hide within the noise so that even though one mutation may be bad, you end up staying in the population. So here's what an example of what I mean. You might have your original here, and you might have your innovation that requires two mutations over here. And if I have my up, this mapping up here, then there's just a delta function here, a delta measure so that there's only one expression. The original genotype gives me one phenotype, so the phenotypic distribution ends up just being a, a, a line there. But if I were to put a distribution here, 
and a distribution over here, these are two still separated from each other. But what this allows me to do is if I had the one mutation case, so let's say I've got this transient, so this is my one mutation. If its distribution overlaps both of these, then what that allows me to do is this is saying that if I have a couple of members of my population get the one mutation, most of them are going to die because they're going to be in the middle here. But a few will be over here, and they'll survive because the original one survived. And a few might actually be over here, and they'll survive. And as long as they hang around for long enough, as long as there's enough of them in the, in the population so they don't get selected out. And they can actually hide within the drift barrier. So it might be that selection, that there's two, I mean, because if you think about it, the phenotype here, even though the genotype's different, the phenotypic difference isn't very different. The fitness difference between the individuals from this hump and the individuals from this hump isn't that different. So they can hide in this population. And the ones up here may actually do better than that population. So they may actually be expanded a bit. But now, as long as they're hanging around, now they have in time, so we don't have to get the mutations all at the exact same time. Over time, you can get that second mutation that you're looking for. And then you end up finding this peak here. So what biologists, at least cell biologists, are realizing is that when you're talking about the evolvability of a genotype, the fact that there is phenotypic variation actually allows for these tunnels between these barriers that otherwise would be very difficult to cross. So if this was just a spike here and a spike here, you get one mutation, you get a spike in the middle, and nobody likes this middle point, um, and so that ends up getting selected out. But the fact that this is broad, this is broad, you get coexistence in between. So this is a region of coexistence. So that coexistence actually is an increase in your genotypic diversity. So this is another way to promote genotypic diversity, which actually has function, as we'll see today in multi-objective, but even in a single objective, potentially in evolvability. So it may seem crazy, but um, but if you're building your own genetic algorithm-like uh, operation here, then you might think about what might be the value of perturbing my genotype before I actually express it. By express it, this might be uh, implemented on a robot, run it in a simulation, or just evaluate a function. And so even though you've got, you, in theory, you've already added noise to get to this genotype, that was what mutation was, this is, after the mutation, this is like implementation noise. Sometimes you get it for free. If you're implementing this on a robot, every robot's gonna operate a little differently, and so that stochasticity comes just from the fact that even though the programming is the same, the actual, when the rubber meets the road, when the tires meet the carpet, then the robot ends up acting differently, and that could be a good thing. In an artificial life scenario, the ecology might give you this uh, automatically. And so you might automatically get this out. And it's not always a bad thing because it can actually promote evolvability through this overlap here. So it's just food for thought about how and when you can further enhance your ability of genetic algorithms to search these things. And um, we're going to hopefully just let that marinate as we go on through this multi objective stuff. Any questions about this, uh, these basic ideas here about variation and evolvability? Yeah. So uh, the second mutation corresponds to the noise uh, that you add, or like, do you actually put a new mutation? No, the, 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 the mutation, this is happening, the noise that's added is, is what's giving me this, each of these standard deviations here. And so this is the, this noise is what's giving me those, these widths. Oh, okay. But then these mutations, that's, that's actually from mutation. So that was actually taking my, my genotype and then during the mutation operator, giving me a whole new genotype. But this is saying even within a genotype, I get um, expression level noise, which is added in. Um, when you actually evaluate. So this would be kind of like in your selection operator before you evaluate the fitness, 
you actually could perturb the genotype before you even ask what's the fitness of this genotype. And, and what kind of perturbation would it usually be in a genotype? Uh, well, it, it, it just depends on how, it, I mean, the basic idea is however you, whatever you've encoded here, like if this is just a scalar value, it might be as simple as, well, instead of evaluating f of five, I'm gonna evaluate f of five plus a little randomness. But usually this is gonna be something more complex like this. So let's say these were weights on a neural network. Um, then I could say, well, I, I think I want this weight to be 0.2 and this to be weight to be 0.3. But I've got multiple individuals that have this genotype. So on one individual, when I, ex when I evaluate that neural network, I'm gonna do 0.2 plus a little noise. And on the other one, I might do 0.3 plus a little noise. And I'm actually going to pit, even though these are the same genotypes, I'm going to pit their phenotypes against each other. So it's they're these two genotypes that otherwise would have equivalent fitness because they express noisily, then these two individuals, one might do better than the other. So evolvability. All right, so getting back to what where we were before. So we've now, um, you know, our, our within this sort of section of MOGA and friends, multi-objective <laughs> genetic algorithms and their relatives. And so if we, just as a reminder, we're now in the space of multi-objective optimization. So up until now, everything was a single objective, F, and we wanted to maximize or minimize F. Easy. So now we have to come up with a new way to wrap our heads around what happens when we have multiple objectives. And so uh, I mentioned that uh, if your multiple objectives are the utility functions of multiple agents in a system, then we have things like Nash equilibria. And Nash equilibria basically are a way for you to say, how might a bunch of independent individuals, each climbing their own gradients, settle out amongst other gradient climbers? And that is the Nash equilibrium. It is a stable point of that process. A generalization of the Nash equilibrium is something called a variational inequality. So there's a wide range of numerical problems that fit in that framework where one individual is doing whatever it one needs to do on its own, but it is dragging other individuals along with it, and they are dragging it along with them. And this mutual process of tugging ends up settling out at something that uh, is either the solution of a variational inequality or in the special case of game theory um, is called a Nash equilibrium. Now, so we were saying, well, that's, that's interesting. So that's, um, we already kind of can picture how to implement that in a population. Each individual climbs their local gradient and just let that go. So we said, well, let's focus on the, something more global, which is how do we find, how do we deal with this other equilibrium concept called Pareto optimality? And so the, I drew kind of a, for the two objective case, I drew a little diagram like this one where I said, imagine if you have some scalar decision variable and um, you've got uh, maybe one optimization objective up here that kind of looks like it's centered on the origin. And I've got another optimization objective down here, which is centered somewhere else. And so um, if the one up top, let's call this one here f of x, and it's good to be higher and call this one down here maybe g of x and it's good to be lower then uh, in this particular case I need to figure out uh, where would a good set of x's be so now I'm not focusing on what is the best x but I'm almost wanting to be more interested in what are the x's that you should never pick and so the thought was that where where you can make a movement that simultaneously improves both objectives is probably a place you don't want to be because you should just move in the direction that improves both other objectives. So I never want to be here because there I can move over and in both cases I move up one object, I move in the right direction. So when, I'm at, when I start at this X, if I just move in this direction, I can get better in F and better in G. And so that Pareto movement, that's what I call a Pareto movement, can continue until I hit the maximum of G. 
Now, it turns out I still can climb with F, but I'm stuck here at G. So now they disagree at this point. So if I were to draw a line up from the max value of G, I can sort of say that is one boundary. And then likewise, if I were to draw down from the max of F, I can say that's another boundary. And I can say in this region, the objectives disagree. And this here is the so-called Pareto efficient set. And it is efficient because if I am a point in that set, there are no Pareto movements I can make. So that defines the point as somehow being Pareto optimal. It doesn't mean that you as a designer shouldn't pick a different point. But it just means that I have no objective way to tell you which point is better than which. Out here, I can say you should never be in these points. And out here, I should say you should never be in these points. But if I throw a whole bunch of these objectives at you, two, it's pretty easy. But if I throw three or four or five, maybe it's not easy for me to graph them. Maybe it's not easy, easy for me to express them. But uh, you know, I want to be able to have a computer program pop out this set. And that's kind of what we're we're going at here. Yeah. Is part of the reason we're talking about this because this is lending itself to heuristic type problem? Like gets you in the area of the optimal solution? Well, it's so the thing about this is I, I don't want to say that this is an area of optimal because there really is objectively no way that I can tell you that one of these is better than the other ones. So in a heuristic, uh, then really, I mean, so. I'm looking for a meta heuristic that helps me find this set, but you can optimize inside that set. Right. Well, then you can use other criteria. So yes. I can say for your particular problem, then uh, you would like to be here, and for your for someone else's problem, they would like to be there. But that's kind of up to them. So they add additional criteria in order to figure out where they want to be inside here. And in order to help them with that then this visualization isn't all that useful. I'd like to somehow see how these two things trade off with each other. So I want to make sure I am on a trade-off frontier. So that's what we're really saying is that if you're in a space where there are ways in which you can operate your system not in trade-off, you want to get rid of those and make sure you're operating in trade-off. And then I want to characterize the trade-off to my stakeholder. And so another way I can visualize this is by plotting that F and G together on a parametric plot. So the X is kind of hidden. And so let's say I put uh, G down here. Um, and actually, I think for this one, for some reason on my notes, I plot it this way. So I will trust me. And so in this one, I get G there and F there. And, um, and so if I were to imagine for every, com for every X, what are all the different combinations that I could get for um, F and G, and maybe it turns out for this one that I can have something where I'm maximizing my F, um, but not maximizing my G. I can have something where I'm maximizing my G, but not maximizing my F. And I can then have a whole suite of things in this area down here. So X is all through here. Um, and then there would eventually be some boundary where basically this space is accessible and this is impossible. And so this boundary here is the so-called Pareto frontier. And it characterizes the trade-off. And so if I know the shape of that, then not only do I know all of the things that are possible uh, that, you know, that lay in here, but I, I also know the, the relative trade-off of those. So if it's flat, then I know that I basically can, for any value of G, um, I'm going to be stuck at F. And so I may as well just optimize G because I'm not going to pay much cost at F. If it's more slopes like this, but it shows there's like a one-to-one -one trade off of these things. And so for every uh, amount of G I want to increase, I'm going to have to drop that amount of F. 
So the shape of this thing is the map. A uh, question in the back, please. Um, my question is, are there any libraries available in Python or something that can even open bucket check and estimate where the permissions are? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, tons. Uh, so I mean, I mentioned like in MATLAB, there's already a GA function. So you know, if you're, so in MATLAB, there's a GA multi-objective. <laughs> that is exactly for this. You give it a bunch of functions, it gives you um, an estimate of where this Pareto frontier and this Pareto efficient set is out. So there's a bunch of API that are already written that implement heuristics that do exactly this. Yeah. So you talked about delivering this to a stakeholder uh -huh. and then they can make decisions based off of that frontier. And right. That makes a lot of sense to me for the two objective case. I'm struggling to, to see what you could deliver to that stakeholder when you're talking about many, many objectives? Well, it's the same thing. So, uh, and I, I mentioned it last time that the idea of the Pareto frontier is reducing the decision space by one degree uh, in such a way that you get rid of all subjectivity. And so here you had a, uh, a let's say um, you've got a two, here I've got two objectives so it's like I've got two degrees of freedom. Well, there aren't two degrees of freedom, that's small problems, they're coupled. But I've got two things to worry about. How am I going to choose something that trades F and G? And I don't quite know how F and G relate to each other. And so at this point, anything I choose I may as well be fine. Like I could say I'll arbitrarily I'm gonna maximize F. Uh, the idea here is that, well, okay, so I'm going to make it easier for you uh, I'm not going to tell you the point you should be at, but I'm going to reduce it so that every decision you make could at least be argued to be objectively made. If I choose out here, you could say, well, why'd you choose out there? I just felt right. You know? So out here is just a land of pure subjectivity. Here, it's, sort of, it's subjective to choose where you're going to be in here, but it's defensible. So it gets rid of all, it allows you to make defensible choices, but it allows you freedom. This is basically saying if you were totally free, you would be very likely to make a bad choice. But this is saying you are free to choose near and nobody can complain. Yeah. Um, again, over here we have two objectives, so it's easier to plot. Uh -huh. um, when we have five or ten, the dimensionality is so high, how do we visualize or know if we're creating our own modules that fit those particular goals? Right. So I mean, eventually, so you're right that if you go from a six dimensional objective space, uh, it's, all it's going to do is go down to five. And then you say, well, how do I visualize five? Well, the thought, so that's where, you know, your kind of cleverness has to come up where you can say, well, all right, if I plot this objective versus this objective, I notice there is a high trade off. This other objective versus another trajectory, there's not as much of a trade off. So at that point, you have to sort of then mine that a little bit to say that there are these, uh, that, I've taken your six objective problem, I've turned it into a five dimensional space of choices, and within that five dimensional space of choices, I notice that really only these two objectives are trading off with each other, and everything else kind of washes out. So, uh, in, like following up on it, like when you were talking about the Nash equilibrium, over here it would apply in a situation where you're trying to find the optimal Uh, my question was that um, in such a situation, we are trying to find Nash equilibrium, right? So right. we are trying to figure out uh, what are the values of x uh, that would be perfect so that we can have a trade off between x and t, the x and t. Right, but these aren't necessarily Nash, but I, I think you're just using that as an example. Like these are Pareto, these are not necessarily Nash optimal. Okay, um, so where does the Nash optimal fit into such a situation? Well, so if if f was equal to, you can ask yourself, um, if f were equal to utility one and g equal to utility two, so f is the return to player one, uh, g is the return to player two, and 
but to make it really, then I would really need to expand this to be an X1, X2, and an X1, X2. Then the question would be, uh, then, so I could still ask, you know, Pareto optimal. What Pareto optimal would mean is that players are playing a strategy for which if one player increases his or her utility, it will necessarily come at the decrease of some other player's utility. And that's what we would mean to sort of say it's Pareto optimal in a game theoretic sense. Now you can define, um, you could also then say, well, is it Nash optimal? And there would be a potentially a, a completely different set of equilibria, not necessarily unique. It could be multiple equilibria that are Nash optimal. And sometimes the Nash optimal intersect the Pareto optimal, but it's not necessary, uh, necessarily the case. But why is that so? Because the Pareto optimal, I can be jealous, like in which direction of the gradient that you should be going to uh, basically say that you've got to optimize for x or for z. Now, in the specification, the Nash optimal would ideally lie somewhere in that slope, right? Not necessarily. I, I mean, it, it's. Uh, because we are trying to maximize both of the functions. So it should ideally be having something like that. I mean, so, I mean, all the Nash optimal just says is that everyone else stays the same, then you. And so you, you don't have control that if they stayed the same, then, then you don't have a, a, a way to increase. Now, that does not necessarily, now, and then that all happens simultaneously. Now, in, in principle, then you, I would probably imagine a bunch of cases where Nash optimal would imply Pareto optimal because if one uh, made a movement that did increase their utility, it would necessarily have to come at someone else's decrease. But it's also possible in Nash optimal that <coughs> everybody would do worse or something like that. So, I mean, Pareto optimal really means that someone is on the verge of doing better. And the only thing that's keeping them from doing better is that someone else has to do worse. But Nash optimal, does everybody could be on the verge of doing worse. And so it really is best that you just need to all stay there. So Nash optimal solutions are often an even lower measure. So if we went from, uh, you know, like this is a, you know, a line, but you know, there, it really might be there's only one single Nash optimal point, whereas there still is a set of Pareto optimal. So it's much denser literature, but you just basically want to just get the idea here to understand we're, we're sitting on a trade-off curve when you don't necessarily have to sit on a trade-off curve, and so we need to find that trade-off curve. That's our goal. Um, yeah. Why does denote a Pareto frontier that's basically the Gaussian bridge line on the uh, right side of the trade off region, right? Yeah. Well, both there, this, yeah, these, these down here are these solutions over here. So, what do we mean by the possible uh, solution beyond this? Well, there are certain combinations of F and G that just don't happen. So, like out here, I, I, there is no way to have an F that's this high and a G that's this high simultaneously. Basically, the ones not on the curve. That's that, right, yeah, the ones that, as you sweep from here to there, you're sweeping out. It's like going a lawnmower across this region here. And uh, it's not necessarily in that order, but that's basically what you're doing as you're sweeping across here. Yeah. yeah. This one's just a reflection. Uh, as you said, there could be a multi-objective uh, optimization. Uh, so can we have uh, each of the objectives uh, kind of uh, can we have each of the objectives component taken along either the fx or gx, and then we can uh, optimize it? Like, you know what I mean? Uh, like, if there is um, another objective called f dash x, and like it kind of is towards fx, like when uh, when we have an optimum value for f dash x, we also have an optimum value for fx, or of the direction in which we advance takes us to optimum values in both cases. Mm -hmm. So can we have kind of a component of it on like each of these, like we can have, okay, so this function tries to like, it has, has a map, uh, maps with fx, and this one maps with gx, and this one maps with fx, and like, like and each of these are optimum, op, optim, uh, each of these are functions that we want to optimize. So can, can well, I mean, there can be degener. I mean, so the the, the Pareto, th there certainly could be degeneracy where um, f and x are lay on top of each other, in which case uh, an increase in f is always an increase in g, and and so in which case there, you're the only thing that would be 
Pareto optimal would be to only maximize, like would be to maximize that, like, like if F and G here were the same shape, then the only thing that would be Pareto optimal would be the, the max of F, would be that single point of the origin. And so if you do have degeneracy in your optimization objectives, then effectively all the ones that lay on top of each other are going to kind of get clustered into one, as if you only had one of those. So certainly you can have agreement between these, uh, but just like here, when you had this agreement here, that, that there was a Pareto movement. So agreement is just going to generate more Pareto movements. And when there's total agreement, the only place where you can't make another Pareto movement is when you've maximized them all. But, well, I was just talking about a bunch of functions, not just two. Like yeah, if you had 10 functions, there might be so much degeneracy that you only really have three. And those three are going to drive the Pareto frontier. What is, let's, let's keep moving. And as big as it is, let's sort of this sort of sort of sink in. But just the basic idea here, you have a, a, a different question? Yeah. Uh, I just want to know, like, what if the f of x is something like dash 2 maximums? And then mm, sure. g of x is just like a, an auto Pareto Pareto frontier mismatch. That's an excellent question. So you can, I've drawn these sort of a single modal or single mode optimization objectives. As this optimization objective gets more interesting, then you definitely still have a Pareto frontier, but the shape of the Pareto frontier gets more and more complicated. And these methods, like here, if I wanted to figure this Pareto frontier, the simplest thing to do, especially if I knew it, like a symbolic expression for F and G, would be just to say, okay, I'm gonna maximize um, you know, W times F of X plus one minus W times F of G, or uh, F of X, where W is anything from zero to one. And I am going to solve this problem for all values of W, and that would end up tracing out this whole region. But when F and G, oh, sorry, that F is really easy. When F and G are much more, much uglier than this, then if you did this approach, you would only sort of be guaranteed to, to find a portion of the Pareto frontier. So things just become uglier, but certainly if you draw it out, then graphically you can sort of figure out where these regions are by using a similar, uh, I, like you say, well, if this, this came up here, then I would draw another region, and you could, you could kind of figure out how it would, it would work out. But then if we want a computer to end up finding these things automatically, then we would like something as, as methodological as this, but this is not gonna work as these things lose their convexity. So, so that's why we have things like the multi-objective genetic algorithm, is that it hopefully handles these really ugly cases where there's a bunch of, you know, a bunch of modes and, um, and inflection points and other things like that. All right, so um, multi-objective genetic algorithm, so why are, um, it sort of makes sense to think about multi-objective optimization problems with nature-inspired frameworks because this actually is a much more <coughs> natural context on which to think about things like genetic algorithms. So the idea would be here is like you know nature is all about trade-offs. You know, so nature and trade-offs go kind of hand in hand, and if and so the. The idea here is that, like, well, you know, when we go back to our vocabulary, we had our decision vector, and that was our X bar, mm -hmm. and we called that a chromosome. <coughs> it was composed of a bunch of decision variables, X, and we called those genes, and the different values of X were alleles, and so those are different gene variants. And so uh, then an individual strategy which I'll call, um, say, X star, we uh, refer to as a genotype. Now at this point, we before we just talked about a single objective, and that single objective I said was, um, you could either think of the phenotype, or um, if you wanted to be more technical, it was the trait value, and so it was a character, and that character had traits, but at that point, it didn't make sense why I was introducing all of these additional terms, when in the end, phenotype seemed like that was fine enough, 
But now we've reached the context where this is the reason why we have those additional terms. And so objective one, uh, you know, we can think of as F1, and that one evaluates to what I'll call character one, which is a, a part of a characteristic here, and each, and then it has its own trait values. And the trait values are just the different values that the optimization objective takes. And so we have multiple objectives now, and each one of them can be viewed as different traits of the same genotype. So um, you can think of this as character two, three, and so on, um, down to say, let's say we have in, and so we'd have some in optimization objective and it provides the nth character. So characters are all of the ways in which we evaluate a, a single genotype. So you, know, the, you might have, uh, you know, let's say um, that your genotype gives you two arms and two legs. Well, under two arms and two legs, it, uh, you know, might be able, you can evaluate that in terms of the amount of things it allows you to do with your hands independently from your feet. But you can also evaluate that into like, you know, the things that have to happen to your spine to make yourself walk upright and all of the extra liability you get there. So there are trade-offs that come from the function you get along one axis versus the function you may lose along another axis. And that's, you know, this is, this is nature right here. So there's not a simple one genotype to one phenotype mapping in nature. There's one genotype to a suite of traits. And those suite of traits together are the phenotype. That's the, the equals phenotype. And so it's very natural to think about genetic algorithms in this multi-objective framework because that is actually a much better mapping to what's happening in real nature. And so if you think about um, what nature is doing is that nature is getting rid of those Pareto movements. If, nat if natural selection can, it's going to remove Pareto movements and land on a Pareto efficient uh, trade-off of these things. Because it would be crazy if uh, you had the ability to find a genotype that improved all of these at once, and you didn't do that. Yeah. Can you get the notion of different functions for each of them? Can you like explain it? Uh, well, you can. If, if you like to think of each one of these as like, uh, so this might be your eye color, and this might be your hair color, and this might be. So this might be the speed of a robot. This might be um, how many wheels it has. This might be. So there's. In, in the end, there's one blueprint for the robot, there's one blueprint for the human being, but we evaluate it along these different dimensions. And it is those multiple dimensions together that allow us to give a, a final score, and that final score is fitness. Yeah. Uh, why nature? Which is a field of dissection, not necessarily? Well, so that's a little bit of a leap, to, but the idea would be that, you know, why, if you could come up with a genotype that was better on in all of the objectives, then you're, you're, that's probably going to be selected for. Like, if you had a huge population and there was a few of them that were on the Pareto front and a few that weren't, those on the Pareto front were probably going to get more representation in the next generation and so on. Yeah. I remember you mentioning environment when you were talking about mapping for the phenotype. Is that have any bearing here, or do we just assume like a constant environment for all these different? Well, so, okay. so that's getting that's how we map all these things to fitness is going to involve the kind of their environment for sure. So I'm kind of like we're just taking for granted that there is some environment on yeah. which we can evaluate these things. But does it impact us as like research? No, I wouldn't think of it in, in at this point. I don't think we, we need to go there. So, I mean, but if you think about it, so okay, great. So let's say nature gets us on the Pareto frontier. Then you could ask nature where on the frontier, and nature's response is anywhere. That's the whole point of us having communities that all share the same space. Is that's nature finding a way to spread out along these trade-offs. You're going to find some things can fly, some things can walk, 
they all are finding a way to one, you know, ramps up its investment in one objective at the cost of another, but ultimately maps to the same fitness. So that's kind of the interesting thing here is that you can have lots of different strategies that are all on the frontier. The frontier really is the thing that has a single fitness corresponding to it. So we can view um, you know, a, this, our population that hopefully comes out of our multi-objective genetic algorithm. It will hopefully give us a population that is spread among our objectives along this trade-off, and this is, you can view as a kind of community with equal fitness um, and different trade-off choices. And the points along this you might view as different species. And so we are going to see that some of the methods for which we enhance diversity along the frontier are to create a computational analog of speciation. So we are going to say, we're gonna take individuals that happen to cluster together, we're gonna to allow them to cluster together, and anyone near them, we're gonna push them away. And, because we've already got this spot covered. And that's a lot like animals that are moving into a niche and competing with other animals inside that niche then there's only one that can maybe live in that niche, and so we're gonna then push the rest into another niche. So you can think of each one of these things as almost having um, a different niche. So these are almost like niches um, within a community here. So if you're competing for the same niche, you're probably only one's gonna survive. That's what we call competitive exclusion. But inside a community, you might all live in the same place, but you all find different niches to exploit within that space. And what you're doing is finding different ways to trade one objective for another. So um, I have a DARPA grant studying uh, uh, computational, uh, what happens when you, to the computational architecture of a stingless bee brain as you make it smaller. And that idea was that you, know, you have honeybees that can do a lot of really cool things, but they can't fit into cavities the size of a teacup. But if you could fit into a, size of a, a cavity the size of a teacup, and you had all the other architecture of a honeybee, then you could do a lot of this cool stuff. And so, stingless bees down in Panama, they can fit the entire colony in the size of a teacup. Mm -hmm. So that is a niche that they otherwise are almost identical to honeybees, but they were able to shrink themselves down. And so we're trying to understand what did they have to trade off in order to do that. That allows the honeybees and the stingless bees to coexist, but they had to make different computational trade-offs and their brain architecture looks very different because of that in order to deal with this compressed size. So that's what we're, our genetic algorithm is hopefully gonna help us find, is a design plan to say to somebody, I don't know what niche you would like to put your robot in or your jet engine design in or whatever, but I am going to give you a community of solutions that can all live in the design playbook. And then based on whatever niche you find yourself in, you can draw from that playbook. And that's what we're trying to get out of this. Okay. Questions about that? So, yeah. So you had mentioned the difference between like different bees along this thing. Right. You would need to stay within that. It wouldn't be like an ant and a lion. And absolutely, I mean, it could be. I mean, it really, when I say when biologists say community, they mean a set of organi uh, a set of organisms living, not necessarily exploiting the same niche, but living together at the same time. Like using the same resources, or well, or uh, potentially using the same resources, using the same resources in different ways. Okay. So they can't. Whenever you have two things that are competing for exactly the same resources, then only only the one that does it most efficiently is going to survive, and that's this competitive exclusion. But if you have a portfolio where sometimes you can use these resources but also these, and somebody else can use these resources and also these, then it allows for you to find niche separation. Yeah. So like lions and cheetahs traded off size versus speed. They're both predators competing for prey, mm -hmm. but they're competing for slightly different prey, yes. and that allows them to coexist in the same ecosystem. I think that's an excellent example, yes. Right, you can think about that as they, they both can achieve the same sort of uh, level of, of fitness, 
and they've managed to avoid each other. So there's another sort of question about like, well, you know, how do you design, how do you insert a new design into a field of existing designs? But that's kind of getting a little more meta than, than we need to get to. But, but this basic idea here is like you'd say, well, I need a predator. Um, am I going to design a cheetah or a, or a lion or something like that? And, um, and both are good choices. But you might just say, with the parts available to me, uh, I can only build legs of a particular size. So given that I can only build legs of a particular size, I need to build the rest of the animal another size. And so I can't go here, so I'm going to go here. But I'm going to be equally happy. My stakeholders are going to be just as happy with this one as they will with this one. They'd be really upset if I built them this thing. Because that's the idiocy region. That's right. This is the idiot region. Nobody wants to be the idiot. All right. So let's get a little more concrete. Uh, so last time I, I talked to you guys, or had you guys brainstorm on sort of ways in which you would find these build algorithms to do this. And now we'll see what some of the experts did, you know, say 20 years ago when they started working on this stuff. And so, um, you know, again, so we're just, we need to, we're going to start uh, with, um, you know, many solutions. And our goal is to produce a set of useful solutions. And so the major change between that here and what we had in the genetic algorithm is that that set, um, ultimately, the person using our genetic algorithm would probably just look inside that set and pick one. So really, we just need to make sure the one good solution was in that set. But now, the entire set is actually the output. And so, um, so the, there's a, the first, kind of the earliest base, the earliest version of, um, well, I'll say basic, um, classes of MOVAs and so um, the first kind of class the kind of the simplest version was the weight based uh, genetic algorithm uh, so I'll call this weight based GA for multiple objectives. And this, um, you can find this in the literature under WBGAMO, weight based genetic algorithm for multiple objectives. And so this is just a traditional GA. So somebody just took an off the shelf GA. But the innovation here was that they are going to take, um, for every individual, they're going to put, you remember I said you can put those weights in. You can say this objective has a certain weight, this other objective has another weight, all the weights have to add up to one. Well, imagine if you took all those weights for all those objectives and made them part of the chromosomes. So now every individual has its own set of weights. And so when you generate a random genotype, you're also generating a random set of weights where those weights are constrained to add up to one. And then you let, so each individual is going to have its different notion of fitness. Um, and so I'll write that down here. So um, you incorporate weights into the chromosome, or if you like, the genotype. And so each individual calculates fitness differently. So if I've got my individual fitness, it's basically going to be, you know, weight 1 times F1 plus weight 2 times F2 all the way plus 1 minus the sum of all those weights times Fn. So they all add up to 1. And so you have these n minus 1 weights that are incorporated uh, into the genotype, and you just let the weights evolve along with everything else. <clears throat> and so this allows you to search uh, multiple, kind of multiple objectives simultaneously. At least that was a thought there. And so that was the first kind of shot at it. Yeah. Did the weights change? Well, they 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 get mutated and crossed over, so they're just incorporated like any other part of the uh, of the chromosome. So like I have, uh, you know, like I, you know, my, my first gene might be fuel mixture in this jet engine, 
My second gene might be uh, weight I associate with speed of the engine. My third weight might be weight I associate with size of the engine or something like that. And then as you mutate, you're gonna change the fuel mixture, but you're also gonna change the weights. Um, and so this allows you to not only explore different strategies, but explore, have offspring that explore different parts of the Pareto frontier. So I'm not saying this is a good idea. This was just the first, cause, and you can see why you would do this. You just take an off the shelf GA with minimal changes, and you can suddenly incorporate lots of optimization objectives into this. <coughs> All right. Does that make sense? Weight, the WBGA MO? What are each of these X, uh, the ones that you explained? Like, uh, yeah, these are the different optimization objectives. <coughs> so, objective one, objective two, et cetera, and objective N. But wait, does it not depend on our discretion about how much we want a specific objective to contribute to the total flow? Well, that's the whole point of the Pareto frontier. We take that subjectivity out. And we say, I am not going to ask you ahead of time how to weight one of these versus the other. I want to just, you to tell me, regardless, however, all of the possible ways you could weight one over the other, give me all of the possible solutions that could come out from that. And then you can decide later how you want to weight one over the other. Because it might be that you find that there's really no trade-off between this objective and this objective. In which case, why did we bother worrying about like this being you know, twice as important as this one? Because in the end, if they don't really have any interaction, I can optimize them independently. And that's one of the benefits of possibly having you know, a third dimension or fourth dimension or whatever, is that you might have that where these are always in agreement with each other, but as you, um, in order to keep them in agreement, you end up affecting how some other optimization objective is. Yeah. And So that's, you know, it's a cute idea. Um, it is, ends up being equivalent to a lot of other approaches. And uh, so ultimately we're gonna go to sort of like, <coughs> the, the this is, these are all the first generation attempts at multi-objective genetic algorithms. And they all are gonna sort of be similar in one sense and we're gonna throw away all those and then come up with a second generation which is really what everybody does now. So this is like the first approach because it was easy to implement. The next easiest thing to implement, which you look at this and you say, well, that's, that's okay, but I don't necessarily like the idea that the weights live on the individuals. It just seems, seems a little strange. And so the next step to that would be to say, okay, let's get something that's similar to that. And this is the so-called random weight uh, GA or the RW GA and it works the way it sounds. I'm going to generate, for every solution during the selection phase, I will generate a random weight. So rather than letting the weights ride on top of the genotype, I just say, I'm gonna let the genotype be pure. It's just gonna have stuff related to design parameters. But when I get to selection, I draw the individual up, and then I draw these weights randomly only at the selection phase. And at the next time I do selection, I draw another set of random weights, and another set of random weights. You could draw them randomly per individual, or you could draw them randomly per round of selection. And so just for simplicity, let's imagine that every round of selection, you draw new weights. So in one generation, they're selected for one trade-off, or one, you know, one balance. In the next generation, they'll get pulled along the other way. The next generation will get pulled along the other way. So the idea is that every generation, they hopefully get pulled to the Pareto frontier and then spread along it. That is the notion there. So, um, and then so then they added a couple of things here to try to keep track of those, those non-dominated solutions along the way. So um, maybe I'll draw a, um, probably I'll just maybe write this out. I'm gonna flip to, this is just RWGA. So step zero, uh, randomly generate our population of solutions. Step one, um, we can evaluate, so we can calculate all the objectives. For all the solutions. Now at this point, 
we should be able to tell that some individuals dominate the other individuals. So anybody remember what I meant by dominate? What does dominate mean in terms of Pareto optimality? If I have two solutions, let's say they differ in speed and accuracy. Um, yeah. The one that dominates is better in both speed and accuracy? It's better in both, right. So you can look through all of your individuals at this point, and there will be some that, where there might be some, that dominate some others. And so these ones are the ones that, the other ones are kind of very unlikely to be used in your Pareto frontier. So at this point, we, um, we update a tentative set, I'll call it E, of elite solutions. And in this case, I've, I'm not going to use the term elite. I'm just going to call them non-dominant. Yeah. So these are our, our candidates for the Pareto frontier, or candidates for the Pareto set. And so we just generate them randomly. So then step two, so you can tell this is, they're, they're getting a little more playful in how they're modifying the GA. So I'm going to select a certain number of population and elite pairs. And, um, and then I can, from those pairs, I can end up um, doing proportional selection like we do for, for parents on who's going to get a chance to mate. So basically, um, I will do kind of a selection and crossover step. Make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. So I'll say a selection of pairs of population and elite solutions. And then in uh, my next step, I can do crossover and mutation. So this in my GA, this is like choosing my R parents, and this is my doing my crossover and mutation. And then from there, um, I can um, select from the, from the, uh, so I do the crossover and, sele and selection, then I can select any, those are going to produce new individuals, and then from those new individuals, I can add more to the elite set. So um, I can then select a certain number in elite to add to E, which is my candidate set of non-dominated solutions. And then they usually add a little bit of local search so the idea here is that because I'm searching for this frontier then just because I found an elite solution may not be that I've actually landed on the edge so I can abandon genetic algorithms for a bit and, and go to each individual in my local solution in my, my local population and just do a little stochastic search around them and just see if I happen to find a, a, a dominating solution. So that's another one that hopefully could maybe improve my population. And then I can ask my termination uh, question. So then after that, um, am I ready to terminate? And so basically, you start with a, a population. And from that population, you generate a number of elites. And you've got genetic operations that bring you to the new population. And that new population includes crossover effects from the elites participating. And then you can do local search. To see if you've got any improvements. And then from that, you can now update your elites. and then restart this whole process again. Kind of graphically how uh, this uh, randomly weighted RWGA operates.
another kind of mutation. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah, this is like standard crossover mutation. And then I guess I should also say that um, whenever you're entire set of solutions that you have, you say, for this solution, uh, is there another solution that improves every objective? And if there is, then that other solution dominates the focal solution. So non-dominate solutions are solutions for which there is no other individual that is better in all ways. Well, like, <coughs> you need to plug in the values that's right. Of each of the, uh, Every individual is going to have a fitness. So you calculate all objectives for all individuals. Yes. And so you've got those values. And so there's going to be some that are like, uh, and let's say you want to maximize two objectives. Well, if you've got one individual, objective is valued one, and the other one is objective is valued two. And another individual, uh, their two objectives are valued three and four. Well, that second individual is better in both dimensions. So that second individual dominates the first. And you're not going to take that. And right, so and you're eventually going to find one that cannot be dominated. So it might be there might be another individual that's better in one dimension, but there won't be an individual that's better in all dimensions. Well, like as you just did, you just compared it with something, right? So what sets up this threshold of comparison? You just compared one feature with like the other one, right? Right. So you've got your two features, feature one and feature two, and you've got an individual here and um, another individual, say, over here, and another individual, um, say, over here. And so I can see that from this individual to this individual, this second individual is better in both objectives. But this individual is only better in one objective. And so I can say that this individual is, dominates this individual. Um, I can't say that this individual dominates this individual, but likewise, I can't say the other. So in this, I would say that these are my two non-dominated solutions because this one has been dominated. Like once you've been dominated, you're out. So everybody can start as a non-dominated solution, but then once you find one that dominates the other in terms of these two axes, then you're out. So, so it's easy to, to evaluate. So we have to constantly compare and that's this. the idea, is that in your non-dominated, there is, uh, uh, you have to do these comparisons. And you, there are probably, you could set up data structures to make this efficient, but for the purpose of discussion, just imagine it's a brute force comparison, n squared uh, complexity, just going through and comparing everybody with everybody else. Yeah. Uh, for the selection of pairs of population, uh, and in each region, is it always that one element is always going to be in that set, or two random, <coughs> like two dominated individuals can also still cross over? Oh yeah, right here, right. Th this you're just sort of generating a, a set of parents, and so um, I think there's probably going to be variants of this. So I don't want to say for sure that it's always going to be elite plus population, but I don't see a reason why. Like I, I think that's on an, an arbitrary design choice. You could probably. Under some heuristic, you might say, oh, I always want the elite to mate with the population because maybe that's a better chance of finding another non-dominated solution. I, I don't know. But I can't say for sure what's best, but I think those are two different ways you could do it. Also, like, as we ask, the local search, is can, can we just sort it? What, what the, that's the problem is you can't sort because you have two dimensions. Okay. It's like sorting on the complex plane. You need to... You can sort in terms of magnitude, but you can't sort in terms of the, on the plane. Because once you have two dimensions, you lose that ordering. So that's why we're going to eventually establish an ordering, and that will be the kind of how we do things now in these algorithms. Yeah, there's a question in the back. Regarding question number four, the, the local search, is it like a random search mm -hmm. in certain regions? Yes. So the regions is like parameters that are like 
That's right. It's like a trust region. So I'm just I'm willing to go a little bit this way or a little bit this way. And so I, I am allowing myself the computational budget to walk around locally just to make sure that I'm really at the edge of as best I can do before I move on. All right. So that is so the last five here. I just want to cover all of the kind of like basics. So there are these, these, these different approaches where we just have the, the weight-based approaches and then this, which has got this kind of interesting mix of selecting out non-dominated solutions. And then the, um, the last one I want to cover is Vega or uh, vector evaluated GAs, which take a another approach that's getting closer and closer to the niching that I was kind of mentioned, this idea of establishing a community of niches. So the idea here is if I've got K optimization objectives and N individuals, then what if I just divide up my N individuals among my K optimization objectives, allow my GA to run, around K GAs to run in parallel, and then periodically allow migration among these communities, among these islands. And so, the, so I'm creating K subpopulations where each subpopulation has a smaller size of N divided by K. And then I just run a GA within the subpopulation. And then I shuffle the subpopulations. And this is a little bit like a migration step. Um, and then continue. And so this is potentially can generate something similar to speciation if you can get individuals that are particularly good at one objective but not others. And so, uh, so when they shuffle, then when they move into another objective space, then maybe they don't survive very well. And so they only kind of survive if they happen to find themselves in a, a subpopulation with the right objective. And so it potentially allows for you to create these like separate species, kind of like lions and tigers that just can't mix at all. But on the way to that, you do get mixing. And so uh, this is, so this was kind of a, again, it's, it was borrowed from this idea that we're, the Pareto frontier is a community space on which there are niches, so we're gonna force the niches where each niche is somehow like a different trade-off between, and this is, it, it's almost like each niche is for each individual uh, optimization objective, but the shuffling creates the trade-off. But it turns out that you can show that this process is identical to just linearly combining objectives with random weights. And so this came out as a novel way to mix objectives by creating these subpopulations, but none of the solutions ended up being any different than these random weighted ones. And the problem with any of these weight-based approaches is that when you have these complex optimization objectives that are not convex, and you put them all together, it's possible you'll miss some of that Pareto frontier. So if you really want to exhaust the whole Pareto frontier, then none of these, uh, these approaches really do it um, because they're kind of based on this idea of this, this random weighting uh, or of just weighting in general. But, uh, but this is at least getting towards the spirit of what I was talking about before. So somehow we need to achieve something that doesn't have this dependence on weights but also has the same idea of creating niches across the frontier and maintaining those niches. So any questions about this approach? And then next time we will start in on the modern approach, which creates that ordering and then, and then distributes individuals across that frontier. These are the old, and then we're going to start on the new. All right, well, that's all I've got for you.